Welcome to this week's edition of Inter-University Debate, which is brought to you by Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV. On this week's edition, we are hosting students of Makere University Business School. Students of Makere University Business School, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so this week's edition, we are discussing oil prospects. To what extent will oil revenue address the social economic problems in Uganda? So, as you know, the issues of oil has been highly discussed in Uganda lately. Uganda has a very long history when it comes to the oil and gas sector since 1920 uh, to the commercial discovery that was in 2006. And as the oil and gas sector continues to progress, uh, there are different challenges and issues that have come up. We have seen issues of human rights, wildlife issues, the environmental issues. We have seen the decision of the EU parliament that decided to um, hold, to advise Total to hold uh, the investment in EACOP. We have seen several other issues in there. Uh, protests uh, from students on street uh, uh, due to the EU decision. We have seen several other issues come up. The president of Uganda himself responded to the EU decision. So all those issues will be discussed today by students of Makere University Business School, MOBS. Before we delve into the discussion, let me introduce uh, the panelists for today. I'll start with uh, the first panelist and the person who is sitting at my extreme left, and that is Ms. Uh, Mirembe Rita. I know Rita was in the previous uh, season as well of inter-university debate. So Rita is pursuing Bachelor of Human Resource Management, and she's a writer and a poet. Rita, you're welcome to the inter-university debate. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here once again and meet you again. Uh, my name is Miriam Berita, pursuing a Bachelor of Human Resource Management, a writer and a poet. I'm glad to be here and discuss with all of you. Okay, Rita, we are happy to have you for the show again. Our second panelist is Mr. Nirinjie Sam. Sam is pursuing Bachelor of Commerce Accounting. Sam, you're welcome to the yeah, show. Thank you so much. Okay. Our third panelist is also a familiar face. I know Sam is also a familiar face. Actually, there's three of you. <laughs> so you've been on the show before. So our third panelist, uh, I know, represented MOOBS previously in the previous season together with Rita. Um, that is Mr. Luswata Simon Peter. Yes, thank you so much. I think you forgot to mention we are semi-finalists in oh. the previous edition. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for adding <laughs> for adding that. So, Sam, you're welcome to the inter-university debate. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, our fourth panelist is Ms. Arinai Tue Daphin. Daphin is pursuing Bachelor of Science in Accounting, and she's the Vice President of Debate Society and founder in Zori Debate Forum. Daphne, you're welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Okay. So as Alia mentioned, we are discussing the oil and gas sector today. We would like to look at the different social economic challenges in Uganda and how will the oil sector address those challenges. So before we delve deep into the discussion, let's start with the overview of this oil and gas sector. And I'll start with Rita. So, Rita, what is the historical background of the oil and gas sector in Uganda? Um, well, the discovery of oil, realizing that Uganda actually had oil, was in uh, 1925. That was a report by George Wayland. So, with with the discovery of the okay, they discovered the spills of oil around Lake Albert. That is the line that separates. Um, Uganda and Congo. That's where they discovered sites of oil. So of course, with that came to the birth of, came to the birth of uh, the first, the first, the first uh, excavation of oil, which they termed as the Wakabi B1. That's when the first extractions of oil were actually dealt with in Uganda, but. Of course, with pre-colonial times and the instabilities that came along with the uh, colonial masters and the World War between 1945 and 1980, 
there was a limitation with the growth of the oil sector so it clearly in that period it lagged and the disc- and and africa was actually seen as the source of agriculture so oil was meagerly neglected in that period but later on when we come to 2003 2010 that's where briefly let me wrap it up with that's where we see companies like total enoch coming in and that's when they are uh, decide to come up with a board of directors to manage oil in uganda that's where we actually look at uh, the birth of the petroleum authority in uganda and the different actually different advocates came in in that period lagging up to 2016 different advocates came in into that period to train people and give people more insight about oil and we are here right now i've tried to wrap it up but there's a lot in within there because of the oil sector because oil is actually seen as one of the biggest greatest minerals that a country can possess to its economic to its social development and growth as a whole okay thank you so much rita for that uh, historical background of the oil and gas sector in uganda let me move to sam so sam rita gave us an uh, historical background my question to you is what is the general overview or the current status of the oil sector in uganda Yeah thank you so much. Uh Uganda's oil sector is quite an interesting one. Uh especially when it comes to the amount that we are going to be uh to be vulnerable to recovery. For example, we have around 6.5 barrels of oil. But then by the nature and by the nature of drilling oil, you really can't exploit a whole of 6.5. You you have to minimize up to around 1.4 billion barrels. Uh, because that is basically due to the nature of the rocks in Uganda and any other country cannot exploit 100% basically because of the technology that is available right now cannot really go down to those rocks hard rocks and drill more oil uh basically we have over five basins that are prospects of oil but then we have a few oil wells which have been explored and are uh, ready for commercial exploitation especially the kingfisher wells and most of them are in the albertine graben uh, along the dlc coast uh, with this oil we think that uganda is actually managing well when you see the measures that have been put in place so that our oil comes out including the president coming up, coming against the eu's decision to 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 halt the pipeline which is a very good avenue for exporting our oil to the post in tanga we think that the current the current oil sector and the situation is under management and we hope for the best in the future okay thank you so much sam before before i move to simon i would like to ask you one more question it is in regards to both the historical framework and the current overview we have seen oil discoveries in uganda started way way back um Rita talked of a report of 1925 and then we saw a commercial discovery in 2006 and then Uganda has now started the whole process why has it taken Uganda this long to exploit the oil and gas sector yeah you see it, it started in 2006 but then you see our economy was so was so stunted that we really wouldn't put up a refinery ourselves so this this has taken long because we've been waiting for potential investors like taro oil which later sold its its rights to total we we have seen heritage oil coming in and many other companies which were starting exploration exploration is basically not a one night thing so you really wouldn't expect uganda to discover in 2006 and maybe in 2007 they start that's basically because the nature of oil exploration and mining is a complex one and it requires time so we think that it was a little late but then we are also to blame sometimes because of the bureaucracy in our systems 
and failure to implement some of the things that were recommended earlier, I think, in 2014, when we had prospects that by 2020 would have our oil drop. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Let me move to Simon. So Simon, in the spirit of looking at the general overview of the oil sector in Uganda, how prepared is Uganda uh, legally to for, for this oil? I mean, the what legal framework has been put in place? Um, if there is one thing we do very well as a country, that is legislation. And I, I believe we have the best laws, but you should know that laws do not work in a vacuum. They work with institutions. The question would then be, are the institutions working? That's a debate for another day. Part of the reasons that Sam was shy to mention of why we did it at the time we did it is that we even lacked legislative measures or the legal system that could, could oversee or guide the, the, the activities that were taking place. Uh, we had the Petroleum Exploration and Development and Production Act implemented uh, in 2013. That is way, I think, some good years after the 2006. Um, this put in place various institutions because laws do not work in a vacuum, like I said, they work with institutions. Institutions like the, the Petroleum Authority of Uganda that monitors and regulates the way we, we work with oil. It works hand in hand, okay, interchangeably without anyone superseding the other with the Environment Act. Because these are things we are talking about that affect the environment. For example, we have the longest pipeline, the Earcorp in the world's history. It covers a lot of spaces. Some of those spaces include wildlife reserves. It is near a lake, one of the prominent lakes in East Africa, the Lake Albert. It passes through various wildlife centers and reserve areas. So you expect at the bare minimum to have a law that is to deal with the environment and we have that. We have the guidelines that monitor how we handle reserves and all those things. We have the the oil company, you the know. Uganda oil mm -hmm. company, and this one works as a company to, to, to foster the interests of government in this oil sector. It works as a company just like any other company, but again, they still state it, even in the bill, the, the Petroleum Exploration and Development and Production of Oil Act, that in an event that the two collide, the Petroleum Exploration Development and Production Act will prevail. That means it's not a company like any other company. It has another law that stands. This shows the importance of, of, of this particular sector to the country. And it was even put in legislation. So we believe our laws are good. We do not know if we talk of the organizations, the others, that, that the institutions that we have, if they can regulate it very well, but then the laws are available, very good, and the guidelines as well, and then the type of sector they are working in is one that is very well regulated in terms of legislation. But whether the institutions are very prominent and strong enough to handle those things is a question for another day. Okay. Thank you, Simon, for that legal framework. So earlier I was saying that uh, despite MOOBs not having a, a law school, they have always come in handy <laughs> <laughs> on issues of the legal framework. So let me bring Daphne into the discussion. So Daphne, aside from the legal framework that has come out uh, quite clearly from Simon, what, has, um, what other measures has Uganda come up with uh, in order to prepare for the oil and gas sector? Okay. Well, before we, we, we go any further, we have to see um, what is actually Uganda going to get so that we see the measures in place for, for everything that is happening so that we can have a better oil production in the country. Besides all that, you realize that when Uganda is a developing country, that is something that we really have to agree to. So when it's a developing country, it's trying to see how we thrive to, uh, to, to be one of the, those developed countries. It doesn't come overnight. It comes with, you know, it's, it's a process that comes. That is why Sam already told you that, uh, you see, since 2006, this has not been effective. So it's a process. It has been in thought that because of the technologies and all that, that is why you actually see it, it took longer than everyone would have wanted it to take. So now going to that, 
if we really look at how it's going to to bring effect but because you realize that actually if the first oil drill starts it's going to increase the gdp by 20 percent so if you realize that by 20 the, the, the gdp is increasing by 20 percent that is something that is very good and the country can stand to be proud of that so if our gdp has to increase to increase there are things we have to look into number one corruption is something that is going to bring a problem to the oil production and improvement and development of our country. So those are things that we're actually supposed to put precedence to and think of how we are going, we are going to actually see that our money, the, the money that is going there, because that is everyone's question. Uganda is so corrupt, so you, even if this money comes out, it's going to be embezzled, it's going to be taken. So if we look into how best we can fight the corruption, the embezzling that is going to come from this money, that means that actually it's going to be sustainable enough. Because you see, if you were, <coughs> and oil, that is something that influences all other sector, like Simon was already telling you. Because you saw when the prices of oil went high, transport costs for every production increased. So that put the economy itself at a, at a threat. So when oil is effective and we have our own oil as a country, that means that even production of all other uh, increment in other, all, all other production sectors is going to be at its best. So that is why we have to first see that this oil that is going to actually bring uh, 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 our economy to a better stand should actually be prioritized. And that is why we have to see into tracking all that money and all that, having sufficient people and sensitive to show people how best this is, this, this is going to bring effect so that we don't have people embezzling these funds. Because you see, why the UNSA students and uh, all those students who are rioting, you realize those are students who are engineers. They are, and they are looking at studying, they're already unemployed. The engineers who are already unemployed. So now this is a project that we thought was actually going to help and bring employment opportunities to some of the students, out engineers out of the university. That, this is something that is going to help other people in, in, in those areas get employment. So now if that's a, a project that the EU now comes against, that means that even these people who are hoping to get employment now look at themselves in dark light and they don't have a future. So that is why I think measures should really be put in place to see that actually uh, this oil project moves on because it's going to take Uganda somewhere. Okay, thank you. I see Simon has something to add. If I can come in about corruption, the very first test that one has to prove or pass when they are dealing with corruption is transparency. Most of the human rights violations that surround this particular project come from people who question and query or even probe the type of things that are done in this project. Up to now, we do not have a clear image of what the contracts that were signed between Tanzania, the, the, the companies, and Uganda look like. That is not for IACOP. E yes, not yeah. for IACOP, not even the members of parliament. So we cannot ask these questions. And when you try to ask, when you try to dig deeper, it, it comes to a point where you cannot go any further. It's either I will come for you, or you will stop because you cannot get that information. But why? Because the 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 act says that this is property of the people of uganda the government is holding in trust mm. so bare minimum they are supposed to tell us each and everything that happens that transparency i think even if we want to give this government a benefit of a doubt it has not been clear what exactly they are doing or even if they are doing it in a clear in clear terms because the moment you default at transparency then we see corruption coming mm. in because we are already a country that is so corrupt for anybody to ever defend this government. Okay, thank you, Simon. Let me get back to Rita. So, Rita, uh, before we even uh, get back and delve deep into the human rights issues, environmental, which we are going to get back into, mm -hmm. what are the expectations of Ugandans? Uh, on one end, I would like you to look at it probably from both sides, Ugandans and then the government. Mm. What are their expectations when it comes to the oil sector? Um, first, I want to delve into what she talked about. She brought in the aspect of uh, unemployment. I think during the period of, uh, from 2006, the excitement that came with oil came with the excitement of very many investors and very many courses actually came up in that period, which has actually brought a big unemployment gap, actually an extraordinary one, because very many youths, actually people excitedly went in for those courses and very many of them are now unemployed. I, I wanted to highlight on that. Then uh, you 
you talked about the expectations that the government has, the expectations that we the people have. Of course, we expect to be employed. We expect to see economic growth. Um, then looking at Uganda as a landlocked country, oil is actually a leeway for Uganda to actually become more connected to, the, to other countries. Because uh, right now, it's being landlocked and actually not having something major, something crucial to export makes it meagerly, makes it meagerly closed, makes it meagerly economically lame, slightly economically lame when you look at Uganda as a country. Then, of course, the government expectations, more revenue, more growth, just basically we are looking at the growth of the economy as, as a whole because of the growth of oil into the country. Oil, oil is, when you think of oil, the thing that comes to your mind is it's gold. It's more like gold because we are looking at a lot of money in place, a lot of money that is going to flow into the country system. Yes. Okay. So, um, Sam, let's delve into the human rights issues because uh, we, we, we watched the EU Parliament make that decision. Mm -hmm. And some of the issues that came out were issues of environment and then human rights issues. So picking out the issues of human rights, what are some of the human rights issues that have been raised in regards to the oil and gas sector in Uganda? Yeah, thank you so much. I think before I start, I can start on Simon's case because when you see when you talk about transparency, even the best countries, for example, Ghana, that makes its contracts known to the people, does not mean that you, you actually get the whole contract and it's out. No. What they actually disclose is like the sharing agreement, which was actually disclosed in IACO. Uganda is going to be sharing around 15%, and total is going to be shared around 62%, I think. So when you talk about transparency, it should be more than that, because... When you see Ghana, their contracts are out, but then they have some confidential information that can't really be exposed to the public because you can't, for example, if you are to sign a contract in a house, there are some clauses that can't go out to the public. So you really can't discredit the government on transparency, like the whole of it, because maybe you're basing about maybe the, the political affiliation, which I believe you know. <laughs> and... <laughs> And I, I really don't agree that the government has purely been reluctant because there are some measures which are in place. Uh, about the human rights violations, I think the IACO project, first of all, the resolution by the EU parliament was, to me, it was actually a baseless allegation because there were environmental impact assessments which were done. I think they were done over from 2014 and about three reports were passed by a reputable international company. And there are also audits in relation to the same. So this was like this was the influence of geopolitics because we see them them passing a resolution, but then they don't have a contradictory position and they don't have evidence that there are many human rights violations going in going going inside near Bunyoro. When you actually come and do a, a, a baseline survey, when you go to Bunyoro, the locals will tell you they have been compensated. Around 98% have been compensated, and the 2% have been hesitant because they want a lot of money, and they feel that the project is not worth it because of their ignorance. So I really beg to differ from your position that there has been human rights violations because we have not seen these instances just because the EU just passes a resolution which is baseless, they don't have a contradictory position that can be substantiated with evidence. We think they are baseless. When you look at the letter that was released by previously by the CEO of Total Oil, when he was invited to, to go and sit with them, one of the things that he highlighted is that, well, you're actually saying there are human rights violations and there are many things going on in the project. But then you have not taken time to do your own audits about the things that are happening. So you sitting in Europe and passing a resolution just to halt something that is in Uganda that you really don't have so much information about is just an assertion which is not backed by, by any type of data that there has been violations, 
there's been environmental degradation. We can actually agree that, of course, degradation has to happen, but there have been mitigation measures, there have been money to plant trees, and the people who have been in these areas have been held have been held to resettle elsewhere. So I think that those allegations are purely not true. Okay, I see Rita would like to come in there. Yes, I would like to I would like to slightly interject some with a few statements. Some forgets that 40, only 41% of the people that actually have been, are going to actually be affected by this extraction of oil have been compensated. Only 41%, and yet 3,648 people are affected. Not really. You see any project, whether building a road or a house, those things have to happen. We have people who have their beliefs that, well, you won't pass here because we have a cultural site and therefore it is a sacred place and you won't pass here. <laughs> such people are not going to be compensated because of their belief. But you see such a small thing can't help a project. So, so Sam, the question is, I think something that uh, Rita raises is only 41% being compensated. Because when it comes to being affected, definitely, uh, even, even if it's not the oil and gas sector, we have seen roads, road construction affecting a number of people. The question is, how far has the government gone with the issue of compensation? Yeah, government has gone an extra mile. When you look at the 40% he claimed, which I think is a wrong statistic, when you see the people he claims were compensated, these people have been given posh houses, which means that in a range of, <laughs> I think, like three to four years, the money is coming, so you, you can't expect the government or the partners in the project to get a large sum of money and they just puff and, and beg the people to move, including those ones who think that the project is not worth it and therefore they are not going to give in their land because they were shipped from there. Such people need time to convince. Even if we take his turn, we think that in the wrong end, I think by 2025 and beyond, when we start getting the oil revenue, these people are going to be compensated. We can't wait for them just because they believe in their gods are there. And as a country, we need this way. Okay, let me bring Simon into the discussion. I've been seeing the body language. <laughs> so Simon, what is your perspective on this issue of human rights? We have seen even on social media, like on Twitter, we have seen the hashtag Stop Earcop. Then, we, of course, now the EU decision. Then we have seen several people, prominent, especially in opposition, come out to say there are human rights issues that have been raised. So what is your perspective on the angle of human rights issues in regards to the oil and gas in Uganda? Federica Masi, a journalist with the Italian media, was arrested bitterly. Josh Cafero, a chairman of an NGO in Bulisa County, was arrested and actually detained for 56 nights. That is way beyond the 48 hours that are talked about in, in, the, in the laws of, of Uganda. The people he claims were compensated. The leader, um, Joseph Robert Bidimuye, the leader of the people that were affected by the Iacop in Chote, was also arrested and threatened with murder. Those are people that need compensation. Now, if what he talks about as compensation is you threatening the leaders of the people who are affected by this project, then maybe I do not understand what human rights violations look like. Mm. You see, Sam speaks about most of the things like he doesn't live in Uganda. Like seriously, he, you, you, you think he has just come from Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because some of these things are things we know. Those are things, those are people I've just mentioned, but a lot others have suffered similar scenarios of human rights violation. And why? Because they try to probe what is happening in there. We are not telling them that expose each and everything that you have on table just so everybody knows what's taking place. But at the bare minimum, at least let our members of parliament know, because those are the people that represent us. You cannot have a government that is working with, with projects in their armpits that you see we are working on this one, because we are, we are even worried. There are people who have used 
individual statements about this particular oil. These things are raising eyebrows. I do not want to, 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 to mention names, but these things are raising eyebrows. So when you come out and tell people, you see, you're going to get just 15% and that's enough information, that is part of the impunity that we talk about in this country. And then secondly, the other things that are talked about, the government is not being honest, even with the figures. The history that we have, you know, beaten once, twice shy. The history that we have with the government and the projects they've signed, is that that is bad? So when we ask questions, we're asking legitimate questions. I believe the EU has not been honest in some of the things that they raised. But trust me, there were some doomsday scenarios that were raised and actually true about this particular project. And I believe government of Uganda and people that, that look like some should at least look at an angle where they can make this right other than just pretending like everything is fine. You know, and that's the business in this country. Even the things that are supposed to matter, we look at them as no more. You see, things that make governments fall elsewhere here are things that also keep people in positions and they get appointments or even further appointments because they've done those same things. So we believe government is not being honest with the things they are doing. The human rights violations are there. The examples are very known and you do not need to... to to come from elsewhere to know we know what is happening in that particular area. And then secondly, when you talk about culture, because when you have a project running like that one, the reason we did not use the Mombasa route that was even shorter was because it was closer to Somalia and the project would be left hanging for, 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 for terrorist attacks. Now, when you have a population that believes you cannot pass their land, and you cannot confuse them as a government, then you have been avoiding Somalia, but then you're going to face it rough from your own citizens. And now when they start to fight back, you brutalize them, violate their rights, and then come here and tell us, you know, everything is right. These people are just being arrogant or, or, or even stubborn. And I don't think that's how things work. At least in a democracy that we, democratic dispensation that we claim to be following, that things don't work that way. Okay, let's get Daphne's perspective, then we move, yeah. then we move okay. back to Sam. To start with, the fact is we need the oil. All that, is Simon is actually, all that Simon is actually saying are things that, well, in a way would be true. But now, the fact is now, we should, like you already asked me earlier, we should look on the measures to see all these things and improve them. We'll admit the, the, the existence of all those facts. That is if they even exist. But the fact is we need the oil. You talked about uh, campaigns about a stop ear corp and all that, especially from the opposition. Now... Uh, these are the same people that are going to say that the government is looking on as people are suffering. The government is looking on as the country's economy is actually going down. Now, these are the people that are already against because of their position and because, uh, you know, there is, there is a framework that is in today's opposition that you have to oppose everything, which I don't think is something that is that is really supposed to be true. Oppose, opposition, being in opposition is okay, but you don't have to oppose everything that government actually brings on. So when now uh, these people in the opposition that are seeing that, that, that are going to the fact that the government is looking on as the economy is going down, well, it's looking on as people are suffering. They're not the same people who are supposed to be saying now, stop a project that is going to improve the country's economy. Now, it puts government in a way that now what do we do? You're saying we are not providing for the people. We are looking on as the economy is going down. And then they are the same people who are trying to bring on something that is going to increase the economy. And now you're saying, please stop that. It's going to violate human because rights. Because we, we have seen, oh, just to interject a bit, we yes, have seen yes. a report that IACO project alone is expected to employ over 15,000 people. 15,000 people. Now, when you, you, you come and say stop IACO, what you're doing is wrong. What you're supposed to come and say, okay, now I think if these people are not going to be compensated, they are not going to be compensated now, like she says already, okay, how do we see how they can get better compensated? If now people are being are being imprisoned because of this and this, so how do we see that these people actually, when they are fighting for their rights and all that, uh, they, they, we can, we find a way of how we can actually place these people and they are comfortable and we place this we we displace these people but place them somewhere that they can actually see that what the government is doing to start with that is sensitizing them. This because some people in those places are ignorant about what is actually happening. They don't even know that the EACOP is going to help the country now. They think those are things those are things for the government. Those are things for you know. 
as learned people. So number one, we should sensitize these people so that they can understand why this is actually happening. Uh, the EU in itself, constructions are happening in the EU. For anything that happens, of course there is a cost. That is something that we all have to concur to and agree. There is a cost to everything. So how you minimize the cost that actually happens is something that you're supposed to actually look into. The measures of how we can better this up and satisfy everyone, not actually playing blame games in this case. I think that is something that is supposed to really be put in place. Find measures to, to cover the loopholes that are happening, but then the truth is we need the oil. Because like I told you earlier, when oil prices go high, everything, every other production process is going to be, is going to be interrupted. So that's why I think we should actually look for measures to cover the, the, the holes that are happening, but we need the oil. Okay, let's have oh, some yeah, back yeah, and, can, then, can uh, and then you sign see, on to You to see, when I say there are no human rights violations, you can't quote out your protest. I can give you like a benefit of doubt that some instances have happened. And you see this thing, whether you're even building a church, someone has to move, yet the church exactly. is a good thing. So you see Simon's claims of, you see a journalist, you see... I think someone in an NGO, you see, we have civil society in Uganda and most NGOs that have to appeal to their patrons, the, the Western countries like Europe and other countries. So when you see a, 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 an NGO, someone from an NGO coming, like you see, they want to grow everything out of proportion because that's where they get their funding anyway. So they can't put an, a, a, a different position. When you look at Simon's claim, for example, Toja Gasima, which I think he still believes in, is that this person is just has fears that the government is going to use this oil. We have seen such instances in Saudi Arabia where it is just going to enrich the first family and they are going to, to get richer and therefore they are going to, to hang on power. That is purely not true. And it is just driven by like the political sentiments that you see when we drill this oil, the NRM government, Museveni, is going to stay in power like a person. And therefore, that's why he actually takes the same line, which I believe is not a true line. Because you see the politics of Uganda are, are played in a very cheap way that even if something is so, so, so small, they will go to social media. They have their bloggers who will go and tag, hashtag, and you find the whole of social media is populated. But when you go to the ground, it, it is a contradictory position. The leader of opposition was there. I think he's even still camping there. And what he's seeing is progress. That well, people have not been compensated. Just as, like I told you, are people who believe that maybe their they are land is being undervalued and believe in other things. When you see the procedure of valuing land, they have different land boards, district land boards. They're the ones which are determining the, the prevailing market prices. So you think they just get a small portion of people who have to disorganize so that they can make news and this project can't go on. So we, we have to disregard such people and deal with them later. Okay. Yes, let's have Simon um, to conclude that argument and then we move to why, the Why public opinion is very important in this particular debate is because there is the oil curse in African countries. The reason why Mozambique has not benefited from the resources that it has is, is simply because they do not, the people in that country have not seen the value, they have not seen what they can earn from such type of projects. And it becomes very worse when these people have lost something, but then still not gained anything in that particular project. That is one. Number two, you're breeding things you do not know where they are going to end. Because the narrative of, of these people are just opposing sometimes comes from a position of you being detached from reality. People have been displaced and people have not been compensated very well. You know what that means? There are families that go without food. So you do not just look at that. Because the, at, the, at the end of the day, you'll have a country like South Africa that is very developed, but with a very big peasant society. And that just brings, the, the inequality that comes there of breeds what we call instability in those particular countries. We've seen it in Mozambique, where those, those, those pipelines are attacked. DR Congo may not necessarily be having oil or even restricted to oil exclusively, but you can now see that you have over 100 militias in different parts of DR Congo, each one of them saying that we've not benefited from these resources. So if I can annex a district and get those resources and sell them myself, ourselves, then we can, we can handle that. You do not want to, to create an environment that looks like that. At least public opinion matters because 
at the end of the day, the people that are supposed to, to benefit are the people that are the owners of this particular oil, that are the owners of those lands. Because they will tell you, I was feeding. Many of them were, 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 were farmers. I was feeding my family from here. I was getting something to eat from here. I've not been compensated very well. And what they are telling me is, you know what? Let us pass here, whether you want it or not. That's not how things work. Because at the end of the day, you might end up having the same oil, drilling it, and then look like Mozambique. Okay. At, at some point, I'll bring Rita in to uh, reconcile the arguments <laughs> <laughs> that have taken place here since um, she has been a little bit. Deter. But before I bring Rita back, let me move back to Sam. So Sam, we have seen the, the EU... Before even the pens that signed the final investment decision, like before the ink could dry, international interference. Is it something that you think as a country we should be afraid of? Yeah, international affairs. Uh, that's that's why I'm saying that someone will sit in Europe just because he was once your colonizer. He, he says he has a say in issues that are affecting you. When you look at Total is, is one of the companies in France, and France is part of the bigger European Union. So you see these people are actually capable of frustrating our own projects because they still have a say since they own these companies. These are multinationals, but they have an origin that side. When you see international interference, sometimes it is actually like necessary because we think human rights is a, a universal thing. So when they get doubts and get rumors which are actually baseless, they, to some extent, have a right because we can't exclude ourselves. But we think that uh, in an aspect where international interference is becoming a problem, then we have to prevail because this is our country and we're an independent country. I think we celebrated 60 years. So there's no doubt that such things are going to happen, especially when there's an aspect of human rights and when there's an aspect of geopolitics of the world. Those things will definitely happen, but we have to stand at a position as Uganda and prevail. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, we will be taking a short break from now and we'll still return with students of Makere University Business School discussing oil and gas sector and how the oil and gas discovery is going to address social economic problems in Uganda. Thank you. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one... Welcome back from that break. We are still with students of Makere University Business School and we are discussing the oil and gas sector and how the oil and gas sector will address the social economic challenges in Uganda. So before we took that break... Um, we were discussing issues of human rights. So I would like to bring back Rita into the discussion and we look at environmental issues, which in most cases have been linked to human rights. But speaking of environmental issues, what are some of the environmental issues that have come up uh, in regards to the oil and gas sector? Um, thank you very much, Tanya. Um, some of the environmental issues that we're looking at is gas emissions, uh, they forget to bring in the fact that uh, with those gas emissions comes the development of very many health conditions. First of all, with the production of oil, with the excavating of oil, with the transportation of oil, comes dangers like leakages of 
chemical gases like methane. As gases like that actually affect respiration, you're going to see more hazards of asthma, um, sinusitis, more complications will actually keep coming in. Now, with the oil and gas sector standing in place in Uganda, mitigating factors need to be put in hand. How are we going to actually reduce these effects? How are we actually going to reduce these leakages? How are we actually going to ensure that the health of the people who are fairly surrounding these areas is actually put into consideration? Because without the people, there is no benefit of the oil because we are looking at the oil developing the poor, looking at the oil helping the people because everything is for the people. Then bringing in the aspect of some, Sam talks about, he, he, he brings in a statement of the white man talking about the oil that is not in his country. He brings in that, that, uh, that air, but he forgets that we are actually still under colonization. We it's raise okay. up a flag of being independent, but we are still under the shipment of colonization. I still belong to Commonwealth. We are still mm. moving with them. They actually mm. rule mm. us. Mm. We are indebted to them. Uganda is still in high debt because of the money we actually keep getting from them. So they are still our potential controllers, and we do not have the technology. We do not actually embrace the mines in Africa as a whole. So we do not have the technology to excavate that well. We are still going to go back and run to our daddy that please. We don't daddy, have a refinery. We, we don't have everything. We're going to go to them running like the children we are right now. So we still need them and they do have a complete pair in everything that is going to happen, in everything that is going to go on. Uh, she talks about we need the oil. I would like to emphasize that actually we do need the oil, but how is the oil, how do we mitigate the negative impacts of the oil is what we actually need to first look at. Mm. That is, those are the factors we need to first investigate. How are we going to mitigate the negative if impacts of the oil? How are we actually going to make sure that this oil benefits the people? Because the money will come in, it's okay. It will come in flowing, but how are we going to structure this money? How are we going to structure institutions to make sure that the revenue that will come from the oil, to make sure that that money will actually benefit the, the, the local man, will benefit the elite man, will benefit everyone in their social strata. Okay. Uh, Daphne, I see you want to add something. Yes. Uh, number one, uh, why I have a problem with the EU is basically one. Uh, she's, she calls them our daddies. She calls them people that we actually have to look up to. Uh, in the debate culture, there is something called, when, whenever you put up, you, you don't agree with a policy, you bring out an alternative. So these are, we believe, are the gods of advanced technology. So them uh, being uh, in opposition with the the oil, the, oil, the EACOP should, as the fathers of technology, who they say we have to be under, should have given us a better alternative that would actually have taken uh, to actually produce better oil. But just saying stop without giving, number one, giving justifications like the environmental impacts and the human rights, that means they would not provide a better alternative for us, actually, who have lesser technology than they agree. They would have put an alternative that would have actually helped us uh, mitigate and all that, even adapt with all this. So, by the matter and fact that they don't justify uh, and bring a better alternative or bet show us better technologies that would have helped us produce oil better, that means that they should not even actually just stop something without justifying anything. Then, agreeing to the fact that um, 
we are still under colonialism. So do you insinuate that we should actually stay under colonialism? Or this could be actually a road that would, would, would drive us to potential and re reality independence other than this neocolonialism. So I think it's high time we don't sit for less and get comfortable because these people are colonizing us, so they should stay colonizing us. It's high time we open our eyes and actually look at things that would help us derive from that, uh, derive from that, that colonialism and actually get to a, to a road of independence. And I think this would really be one of the grounds. But re on the realization that is actually, I think we are losing Africa, we are losing Uganda because now if they start producing oil, we think it's going to actually uh, you know, bring them to a point that they are independent and they will never be dependent of us. That is I think a strategy that is actually bringing us to further colonialism rather than taking us away from colonialism and making us independent. So so they should have provided a better alternative. Number one, in terms of technology, showing how we could better this without actually destroy, destroying the environment, uh, seeing how we would work out this with producing less gas emissions and all that. But by the matter and fact that there is no alternative, I think that's why I have a problem with the EU's decision. Her arguments about independence remind me of my little niece who says she wants to move out and have her own family in her own house where she can take <laughs> bread at any time she wants. <laughs> and that's what she wants independence at seven. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me let me bring Sam back into the discussion. Yeah. So Sam, looking at uh, the environmental issues that have been raised um, fr by Rita, so how is the government uh, addressing these environmental issues? Yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, before the break, there was a concern of the, I think from Simon, the oil curse. You see countries which have experienced the oil curse are countries who have, which have not arranged their development goals to the oil revenue. For example, we have NDP 40, 2040, uh, the vision, and the, which is broken into NDPs. You would actually see that they are factored in oil revenue. And this revenue is actually going to priority sectors like agriculture, priority sectors like capacity building, building schools and hospitals. So when he talks about Mozambique, these were countries which actually drilled their oil. They had no development plans which were arranged, and therefore they spent this money in buying military weapons. And you see, when you buy a weapon, the, the person who benefits is, is the regime, like the smaller cocoon of the regime. So the, the oil curse is, is bound to happen in such countries, which I don't think is going to be Uganda's case, because we have our priorities aligned, and I don't think such a thing is going to come, even in the future. Uh, about what government is doing, you can see there has been an effort in planting trees. We think that the, the emissions which are factored in, which are actually unavoidable, because we need the oil anyway, there has been an effort in reforestation. When you look at, especially the Bunyoro region, uh, some of the support that has been delivered is like these trees, which are going to be absorbing this, 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 these things in the atmosphere. When you actually look at, like for example, the effect of a pipeline, this pipeline is being buried deeper so that still grass can grow around and, uh, and flora and fauna is still going to flourish. So we think that the environmental concerns are, are maybe going to come in the operational phase because we're definitely going to dig. But in the subsequent operations like uh, transportation, I think that will be done because they are intending to bury the, the, the pipeline deeper and still trees are going to grow. And we don't think that that is going to be a concern. One of the things that are going to come up, which may be so controversial is the aspect of oil spills but you have seen mitigation measures like using fiber optic cables to actually detect anything that leaks along the ready the, the pipeline so we think such measures have been put in place and the the the, the effects are unavoidable but we are trying as much as possible to minimize and mitigate the effects of climate change that might arise Okay, so let me move to Simon. So Simon, let's let's look at this discussion from a different angle, the issue of corruption that came up earlier from you, from Daphne. Um, a lot of money is expected to come out of the, the, the oil and gas sector. 
and we have seen Uganda grapple with the issues of corruption. Do you think this is going to be different with the oil and gas sector when the money actually comes? When we, when we start making money from the sector? Let me start by responding and then come to you. When, 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 when Sam and Andrita talk about a situation, it looks like there are some concerns. But according to the Ministry of, of Energy and Mineral Development, the project is going to be releasing about 20, between 20 and 40 kilograms of carbon monoxide. And that is very less compared to the global average that is about 30 to 70. So they, they categorize the whole project falling into the category of low emissions, meaning we have nothing to worry about. And that is what we, we say these people are not being honest because certain times they don't align their minds to the things that matter and they just flag everything off. That you see, that is okay because according to our research, this is what we have on table. But I think they can agree with me now, even some, that the, the, the ministry is not being honest with their digits. That is also corruption. I, I, do not, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that you will not see a change in this country when we get that revenue, there will be change. But are we going to get the change that we deserve from such a type of a project? I don't think so. But this project is going to run for something like 25 years or thereabout. I, I do not think we shall be under the, the custody of this regime. I don't believe 10 years to come we shall still have the same corruption. There's going to be a time when things will change for the better. I honestly believe. Whether it's NRM in power or anything, I think there's going to be a time when President Yoweri Museveni will look at developing this country and looking at a future where he wants even his own children to benefit. So I believe at, at, the, at the onset, the project is going to be exciting. People are going to see money. But then it, it is not going to develop people because there is something, an aspect in economics, where a country is very rich. For example, today in Russia, they'll tell you the ruble is very high compared to the dollar, but the people do not see that money in their pockets. That's what you're going to see in Uganda for a longer period of time, whereby the country is rich, you have the GDP very high, but then the people, the income per capita is, is, is not very well off compared to what we see with the GDP. Those type of inquiries are the ones that I'm going to see. But again, we are going to see money pumping into the economy and there's going to be some little bit of change. But however, the change that is sustainable will come in future, certainly. Not now. Okay, let me move to Daphne. So Daphne, the issue of corruption has been a vice in this country for a long time. We have seen the government set up the anti-corruption court. There is the anti-corruption act. There is the IGG. There is the state house anti-corruption unit. We have seen all this in place, mm. but corruption is still there. So with the expectation of a lot of money coming out of the oil and gas sector, how best do you think the issues of corruption should be addressed? Well, I think in 2019, yeah, I think in 2019, I think it was around 4th December or yeah, around there when there was the anti-corruption walk. Uh, my view is we should leave the talking and do the walking. Walk the talk. You know, everyone is preaching corruption is bad. Even the corrupt are preaching corruption is bad. <laughs> they, so they I also participated recently, in the walk. Uh, uh, recently, um, uh, Mebo was interviewing someone and he openly agreed that he takes bribes and he has not once, not twice. And he was justifying that it's, it's really okay because everyone needs the money. So I've not taken one bribes once. I've taken bribes many times openly in broad daylight on, med on, on, on TV. And that is something that really breaks hearts, especially when we see such a project. So when, when we all say corruption is bad, corruption is bad, but don't go to check our hearts, then that means we are doing nothing. And then that is even going to bring an impact on the future generation. So if we really think that this is a, a, a project that is going to come, bringing a lot of finances into the country, then we should look at ourselves. Because reality is this money coming is one thing. And 
it helping the country is a different entire thing. So before we even start thinking about corruption is bad, all this, then we should first look at ourselves. You're in office, there are people suffering and we are claiming we are people who want to serve the, the, the people, obligations of the government and all that. But then there is no point of self-conscious hmm? and thinking about now if i am doing this how is it going to help someone this is entirely about me and and my family so it's really that's why i say it breaks hearts when you see a, a, an entire official admitting on tv on an interview that he has taken bribes once and you, you see member even went on to ask like are you serious like okay she even went out of words like it was such a sad, a sad hearing to her ears that she's, someone is agreeing that they take bribes not once, not twice. And this is taxpayers' money. Uh, so if we have to really go forward to get revenue from this from this from this project then we should stop the we should actually not only do the talking but actually do the walking it starts with you as an individual then it moves on to everyone else so i think walking the talk rather than doing anti-corruption walks and all that that is a mere walk it's not going to solve anything it's just showing people that corruption is bad but people already know corruption people already know corruption is bad so can we start walking the talk now and then i think it's going to breed more effectivity if this project has to really help the people. Okay, I see Simon has something to say. There is, there are various types of corruption. For example, a civil servant who works in an office and is handling people who are maybe submitting receipts or something. And because of your late submission, I take a bribe of 10,000 from you for me to accommodate the documents you're bringing. Mm -hmm let that's necessity that's because yeah. such a, a civil servant is earning <laughs> mm -hmm. around five hundred thousand with three kids living in town they have to pay rent they have to pay fees they have to eat they have to work every day the salaries that those people get are not enough so when i take ten thousand from you that would be corruption but then it's for necessity that and would simon not, that was right that, right. that is right that I would not be here. bad for a reason that look these people are also victims of the system. What does the system look like? For example, the, the, the final investment decisions and the contracts that have been signed are worth 6.8, they're about billion US dollars. The ones that are signed with Ugandan companies are just 25% of that, 1.73 billion. Where the other money is going, we all do not know. Uganda is getting just fifteen percent of a no project worries. of their of their of their own. But in an event that we want to understand why we are getting small, or there are justifiable reasons as to why we are getting very, a very small portion on our own project, let that money go where it's supposed to go. The corruption that is entirely bad is you taking the money that is supposed to build a hospital or a road to something that is for your own benefit but for example if you're underpaying someone you're simply say sending them out there to fight for themselves because you cannot sustain a life with just a salary of five thousand ugandan shillings or five thousand five hundred thousand ugandan shillings a month you cannot sustain yourself with that and then secondly i think government is defaulting around 160 thousand jobs are the ones that are going to be gotten right now they say they've they've given 5,000 jobs already, and 94% of those are, are for Ugandans. One would wonder, what are they like? Are they jobs that are very good? Because we expect this project to employ Ugandans. For example, if the government keeps on underpaying people, underpaying civil servants, and then they do not pump the money where it's supposed to go, we are not going to see those things end. But I don't want us to condemn corruption like it's the end of the day. Sometimes it's for necessity because of us mm. being victims Just of the lines. system. <laughs> okay, I see Rita has something to add. Uh, as you add that, I would like you to also um, address us on how best we can handle human rights challenges and the environmental challenges that have come up. Okay, so first of all, Simon speaks through what I was going to say. Um, corruption is bad. We all know it's bad by human instinct, by human law, by social law, by civic law, it is bad. But what brings forth corruption? What entails corruption? Corruption is a feast, actually. It's a table that if we start eating, we might not finish. You get it? 
But the major factors and principles we need to look at is that a poor economy, an economy with a very low GDP, will actually, can't actually highly reduce corruption. The things we need to look at is how can we mitigate corruption from the top? How can we mitigate corruption? He talks about the funding itself. If at all the work that I am doing is not equivalent to the salary I am given, trust me, <laughs> if I have a sick child at home, I have children who are, who are not going to school because of failure to pay school fees, I don't have food for the next meal. That money that they will offer me, trust me, it is very hard. Just as a minimum that you will reject that money because you think about all those things you've left behind, which comes back to institutions. How are they actually going to, how, how can they actually reduce the corruption, mitigate it? That's where his argument comes in of uh, proper, 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 yeah, yes, of the funds. So that's where his argument comes in. So corruption is a feast that if we start talking about it, we might actually not finish. The necessity of corruption, you remove it from the system, the civil service will, will, will fall down. It will collapse you all. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Rita, the issues of environmental and uh, human rights, how do we address? Oh, yes. How do we address them? Uh, human rights, environment, first of all, policy, implementation, institutionalizing, the government would okay the government and the partners at hand who are involved clearly stating the procedures that are going to be taken to excavate the oil how are they going to we need to look at the risks that are going to be entailed we need to look at how the assumptions of actually the assumed risks that will come along how are we going to mitigate those risks which people are going to be in charge of those risks basically a risk mitigation plan to see that the environmental factors are reduced, to see that they are managed, that is all, a risk mitigation plan. Human rights, looking at the human rights, we're going to go back to the money. I, I argued that 40, only 41% have been compensated. We're going to go back to the, to the leaders above, and the leaders above themselves need to come to the grassroots and look at the leaders down there. How are we going to make sure that that money has reached? We need to make sure that every individual that is going to be affected by the oil has been given the proper funding, the proper compensation that they actually deserve. Because trust me, these lands have been used by these people. These people have been farming on those lands. These people have been rearing their animals on these lands. So how are we going to make them feel the comfort within that actually they can take the land, I'm now comfortable. These are the things you need to look at. The local leaders themselves, she, she brought in an aspect somewhere of, uh, oh, forgetting it, she brought in an aspect of uh, talking to the people, talking to the sensitization. people. Sensitization. Uh -huh. She brought in an aspect of sensitization. Not everyone knows English. That's the, that's the main thing. Not everyone knows English. Not everyone understands what ECOP is. You don't expect that man down there who stopped in P1, P2 to understand what ECO is, to understand what it does. <laughs> they, all they know... <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they are in general people. So yeah. we, now what I'm talking about is bringing in... Look what I'm with you. This person is going to understand those things. If you go to that man down there, trust me, randomly try it out. Go to the village and uh, talk to someone about what is going on in the oil industry. Yeah. Sounds... Uh, on, uh, on that angle, Rita, you see, when, when the colonialists came into Uganda, we previously first had, uh, we had the explorers come in, right? Mm -hmm. We had missionaries come in to soften our hearts and, you know. Do you think the government should have started with sensitization before the oil uh, extraction, or the oil project, the whole oil project even started? Yes. Yes, I believe so. I believe the government should have started with sensitization. And that's where the problem of some talks about this this person believing that removing their gold or removing their tree, something of that kind, that aspect that he brings in, it's because of the lack of sensitization. 
my okay. clapmates that come from magical elections don't do those things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay. Okay. Let me let me bring some into the discussion before mm. you even supplement. Uh, my question to you is: We expect the oil sector to address social economic challenges. So, what are some of those challenges, and how will the oil sector address them? Yeah, you see, uh, as I've said, uh, others had said earlier, um, one of the things that the government is doing is aligning its goals to the vision. You can see there, you there is uh, a regulatory framework. I think Oil Revenue Management Act, where they are actually saying that they are going to get this money and take a, a people focused approach. There is going to be investment in agriculture, especially when you look at NARO, which is one of the organizations that is responsible for research. Mm, it is being currently underfunded. And we think that oil money is actually going to increase capacity of these organizations. And agriculture is going to afford it. You can additionally see that the education sector is somehow struggling, majorly because it is not our making. It's, it's about the funding, for example, UP and USA. And these are some of the avenues that talk to society. Even when the oil is gone, when you actually try and give someone education, proper education, you have seen schools like Chigumba Petroleum Institute coming up to skill these people. Even if the oil is gone, there are many oil wells in the world. These people can export their skills. So I think th this is one of the best approaches of using this money. When you look at uh, the Vision 2040, which talks about someone having a, a per capita of, I think, $9,000. This is majorly going to come about because people are going to be enforced with money from oil and they are going to build their capacity. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the measures of addressing environmental concerns is, I think, proper waste management. When you look at the, the, the framework, over 12 companies have been licensed, especially Ugandan companies, to undertake waste management. Simon talks about unemployment or, or, or 1,060 jobs, something about jobs. But you see, for people who don't believe in employment, there has been a supplier database where you go and register if you have a skill, if you have a talent, and you can sell to the oil sector. These are avenues that are actually creating more avenues of managing the sector, not focusing on employment. You can acknowledge that Uganda is still doing capacity building. People are going outside to to study. So you wouldn't expect Total to get a general manager who has zero experience because he's a Ugandan to go and, and, and manage their projects in the sector. No, they are still, they are going to opt for someone who is skilled. So the government is trying to, to build the capacity to manage these projects. And I think it would be early to claim that most of the top positions have been taken away by foreigners that is just why because we, we still don't have the capacity right now. Okay, so si Simon, your perspective on the social economic challenges that will be addressed by the oil sector? Um, I want to start by responding to what he raised. I think he's right. From 1953, South Korea and North Korea are, are at war. They had a ceasefire, but they are technically at war. But when they had the Kaesun Park, where South Korea was to help North Korea build the capacity in industries, they brought the top management, but these other jobs, the opportunities that are a little bit lower, were left for the people from North Korea. Why? Because they had, from, they had to benefit from the project that is their own. So I believe we can have the top management coming from outside, we agree, but give the bigger portion and some of these contracts to the people that can handle. Even in Kaesung National Park, rather Kaesung Park, they brought people to train others if they need be. Because you cannot tell me seriously, hmm. one of the universities that, has, that is even a top university in Africa cannot train people, Makerere University, cannot train people to handle such projects. You cannot convince me to need somebody very persuasive to tell me that we do not have people that are the capacity of a general manager in that project. It would need somebody very persuasive. But secondly, Sam is not persuasive true. enough. <laughs> yes. So let's just have uh, Simon finish that point. We have actually run out of time. So, so, so I would need somebody very persuasive, but give back the jobs. 
if you're going to develop your country, because at the end of the day, if you give it to those people to come here, you will not benefit. Those profits are going to be repatriated and you will not have anything in your economy at the end of the day. The silver bullet to you developing from such a project is you giving the people the money, the opportunities. First of all, they get money to, 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 to improve their standards of living. And secondly, that money is still pumped into the same economy which is very different when it's the people coming from outside Uganda to, employ, to, to, to get those projects. How, actually, um, Moi Kibachi developed Kenya in such a, sh a short time compared to Moi is because when he was giving contracts and tenders to build roads, to build hospitals, he gave them to the natives. They pumped the money into the economy back and you increase the standards of living of your people. Those are some of the things. We are not waiting for the cash that is going to come because even if we earn billions from, from, from the IAPO, that's going to be coming to our households giving us money. You get it? We have to work for it and get these job opportunities that will transform our lives vis-a-vis -vis the development of the economy of the country. That's what we ask for. Improve the standards of living of the people okay. through employment. Okay, let me have uh, Daphne, then uh, Rita will briefly wrap up. So, Daphne, how best can we preserve this uh, oil and gas sector to benefit the future generation? To be okay. And uh, now that is what I really wanted. Now, you see, uh, when when this oil, because there is a, there was an excuse that actually um, this in the long run we will actually not need oil. The world is getting electric rather than uh, the need for fossil fuels. But then you realize that. Even when the world is getting electric, there are certain machines that don't work electrically. So they still they will still need oil. And for this oil to benefit the, the future generation, it goes back to how we administer it now. Because if, if such a generation comes, number one, we'll need skilling. Because if such skills are repatriated like, you, like they already say, then that means that it's not going to help the future generation, especially within the jurisdiction of our own countries. Now, when these people are sensitized, because you remember that those, those, those philosophies that were there, that like when people were young, they would gather them, tell them stories. That is how we link up with, with the past where we were not. So, but that is because our grandparents, our ancestors were part of the past. And so they try to engage us. That is why even other people feel like this one should not pass here because it's our culture. So can we embrace it more as something that is our own so that even when we are telling those, the, that generation that is coming, we, we, we tell them of a story that we are involved in. But you will not tell a story of something that you're not actually engaged in. So that is why sensitization is very important. It doesn't, by the way, I was talking about sensitization. It doesn't have to be in English for people who, are, who did go to school and all that. This is involving in a way that if, it can even be in local languages. So people are aware of actually what the project is what it means what its benefit are going to be and that is if it actually benefits them number two are going back to involvement so that comes with skilling okay expert okay those people can come but then the common man should also be engaged that is why i think i'll relate you so much to the past in this you'll find a family that they are known these people treat a certain kind of disease with this herb you will find that generation ongoing, even their children can do that, their grandchildren. So it's, 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 it gets like a hereditary culture. So that is how we should embrace this. But that comes with a skilling of, of, of the, the, the common people, the ground people. So when these people are working, these people are supposed to also be involved. They can get the knowledge. They can get the, the expertise. So that even if it comes in the, in, the, in the future, the generation benefits in a way. And then uh, preserving that and then that helping the economy in itself is help, helping the incoming generation. But if we are not involved, if the common man is not involved, then there's nothing to do with helping the, the coming generation. Okay, let me let Rita wrap up in a minute. Uh, yeah. To agree to disagree, I would agree with him that uh, he needs to like okay, like he brings in the idea of uh, they need to bring in the foreigners, and I would disagree with the fact that those foreigners don't need to take like the bigger portion of the of the entire thing. The thing is, in uh, management, there is what they call succession planning, training and uh, placement. 
So all we need, let them come, let them train, let them teach them, let them get used to the system. When they get used to that system, managing with the knowledge they have, if they've understood what they've told them, they can't fail to manage those okay. systems. Oil and gas will reign in Uganda very well. It will prosper. That's all. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We have come to the end of our debate for today. Mm -hmm. I would like to say thank you to students of Macquarie University Business School. Thank you, Rita, Sam, Simon, and Daphne mm -hmm. for gracing our invitation to the inter-university debate and for being very articulate mm -hmm. in the talk show for today. I would like to say thank you to Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV for organizing inter-university debate where students uh, who are at university are able to debate topics that affect this country and the world at large. I've been your moderator for today. My name is Lake Gender Fancy. I'm an advocate, a lecturer, and a tax consultant. Till next time, bye.